So um, we'll be in James chapter one tonight, uh, chapters one and two. And um, we're going to just sort of spend some time with this this text. And, and part of it is probably pretty familiar to you. But uh, I, I want us to talk about this in in the context of our our continuing conversation about worship. And, and what is it? What are we trying to do in worship anyway? What what makes acceptable worship? You know, the, the, the church has had lots of opinions through the years about what kind of worship is acceptable and what kind of worship is pleasing to God. Uh, we've, those debates have uh, um, often taken center stage in church history and, and have, um, resulted in splits and resulted in some real, uh, you know, some, some, some really hard feelings and, and struggles and, uh, and blemishes even in the history of the church. But, um, but what makes worship pleasing? What is acceptable in, to, for worship? What, what kind of worship is God looking for? We talked about some of that, especially with Jesus and the, the woman at the well in John 4. But uh, let's turn to James chapter one. And um, if somebody would, would you read uh, chap uh, chapter one verses, uh, let's start with verse 19, 19 through 25. Who's yeah. You know this, my beloved brethren, but let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, putting away all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only deluding your own selves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth away, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But he that looketh into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and so continueth, being not a hearer that forgetteth, but a doer that worketh, this man shall be blessed in his doing. If any man thinks oh, you, so, uh, you can pause there, actually. Okay. If you would mind. Yeah, thanks. Um, so um, James begins with this uh, this sort of idea that um, that uh, well, as he says in verse twenty one. Uh, Humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Uh, James has this, this picture that all of us as believers have something, I, I believe implant is actually the word that, uh, that is in the King James Version. Uh, we have this, this something planted in us. Uh, what does that make you think of? If, if a word is planted in you, what does that make you think of? How, how do you how do you how do you think of that? How do you what what does that bring to mind? If you plant something and it doesn't grow back out of you, you haven't planted it, you buried it. Okay. I mean, I think it's you know something's been planted in you, but there needs to be outward signs of it. Okay. Yeah. When you have something planted, you expect growth, right? You expect fruit you expect something to be happening it's not just um information transfer right there's an expectation in the in the transaction there's an ex expectation that something's going to happen uh, as a result of this word being planted uh, what word are we talking about the gospel the gospel yeah you look back at chat at verse 18 uh, that how, how God chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. 
So the, the, the picture is, again, there's a picture, right, of, of, of life. It's not just, again, not just information transfer. There's, there's something happening here. There's, there's life. There's growth. There's a new birth. There's a new beginning, a new, a new life. And, and, uh, and so as he talks about our, our receiving the gospel, he talks about it in terms that makes us expect that there's going to be growth. There's going to be something happening because of this in us. Um, so because of that, uh, we're not just people who listen to something, right? We're people who respond whose lives respond. And that's, that's God's intention. That's what God has done. And if we're hearing the gospel without it really changing us, without it making a difference in how we live our lives, something's gone awry. Something's gone wrong. I think we all agree with that, right? I think we recognize that the gospel isn't just something we listen to. It's something that transforms us. It's something that changes. Comments, thoughts uh, about that. I, I really like this picture because it, it, I think we are so, uh, we so, we so tend to the idea of information transfer that, you know, if you just, you learn something and when you learn it, uh, it changes things. But that's, that's not how this works, right? I mean, you can learn all sorts of things and, and never change. There's never transformation, really. There's maybe some surface changes in your life when you learn something, but but it doesn't always mean that there's been this real transformation, this new life, this new birth. Um, so, what do you think? What what are, what are your thoughts as we as we start this this, this text and, and, and talk about uh, the word planted in us and, and what it does for us? Well, I think about um, where it says you have to humbly accept it. And then the little um, reference in Ephesians 1 talks about uh, being transformed, so to speak. The Holy Spirit is there, but you can also hear the word. And that's one way that it can be planted in you. But if you don't accept it, the growth won't be. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Part of part of the, the process seems to be our attitude in accepting the word mm -hmm. and receiving it. Um, sometimes the prophets talk about, you know, our, our hearts being soft or our, our, our lives being soiled for God's word so that it can grow in us. Um, the receptivity of it, right? We're, we're humbly, we're hearing, but we're humbly hearing, we're humbly accepting as we hear. Um, as opposed to what? what? What kind of hearing do you think he's talking about when he says, don't merely, verse 22, don't merely listen to the word. Don't just be a hearer of the word. What, what, what kind of attitude is he talking about there? I guess listening with an intent to do something. Okay, listening with an intent to do something versus some other just kind hearing of it. hearing. Well, Daryl Hudgens used to always tell this joke uh, about uh, uh, the, the guy who came every Sunday after the preacher would finish his sermon. This guy would come up to him and shake his hand and say, you know, way to go, preacher. You really told him. Did, did he ever tell you this joke? Uh, way, way to go, preacher. You really told him. And, and uh, every Sunday that happens. And, and this preacher was kind of hoping this guy would sort of you know, take the lesson for himself. And one day the weather's bad. It ends up only being the preacher and this one guy. And he's like, I've got my chance. And so he really lets him have it and tells him everything he wanted to tell him. Guy comes up, shakes his hand and said, way to go, preacher. You really told him this morning. Too bad they weren't here to hear. Um, maybe that is something like the, the attitude that James sort of pictures here and contrasts with uh, with humbly accepting the word. Maybe, you know, thinking it's for everybody else, right? Thinking it's for, for everybody but me. Thinking it's it's for uh, some other category of people than the one I'm a part of. Ron? Yeah, well, I mean, Mark Twain sort of famously parodied in Huck Finn, 
um, a congregation along the Mississippi where there were basically two family clans and they both would go to church and then as they were leaving they would get out their rifles and start shooting each other right 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 and i mean that sort of funny and certainly um designed to have a little bit of a dig at uh, christianity but in in fairness to them the the trick is to recognize that people do have blind spots um I mean, you you do get, you know, blinkers that are pushed on, and um, you may be able to sit in the worship service, and it's just going, and it's not getting in, yeah. um, and so you don't end up doing it. Um, and I mean, it's easier for an out, it's easy for an outsider to see it. Sometimes the whole church is an outsider. They, 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 culture or things around them have blinded them to that they, they've gone away. And um, so, I mean, so it's easy for him to say that, but it, I, I think we've got to realistically realize, I mean, that it may not occur to people. Um, so, so it's a real, I think it's a real problem. It's, it's not, as easy to criticize because we all probably have a bit of that going on anyway. So. What is, what, how do we start to develop a, a, an attitude of, of humbly accepting the gospel? Uh, and it's not just one time. I mean, James is just talking about, you know, you accepted it at one time when you, you know, believed in Jesus and were baptized. It's not just that. It, it, how, how do we, continually sort of have this attitude of humble acceptance of the ways the gospel continually calls us to change and to be different and to, to see our world differently, the people around us. Differently. How, how do we develop that attitude? What, if it's true, and I think it is, Ron, that we all struggle with this, what do we do to start to develop that? And I'm not just asking Ron, I'm asking Ron. Well, I think one thing we have to do is we have to be willing to get out of our comfort zone. Yeah. So, I, I mean, we can all get sort of insular about stuff. So being open to other people's thoughts and approaches to things and legitimately... <laughs> Thing I'm go I'm going to look at this, you know. Yeah. Um, I may not agree with it, but I'm going to look at it. even the process of doing that may open yourself up, or you know, if if there's some type of improvement or or this that and the other um, that's suggested, actually opening yourself to say, "Am I guilty of this sometimes?" And then you immediately, well, yeah, but it's that it's. Well, and then recognize, okay, now am I starting to rationalize immediately? Um, or is is there some mark here that's being hit um, or ways that I could improve um, in this particular area? Because if you're not open to the change, I don't, I think, I think God can still change you, but it's, I don't think it's going to be nearly as easy, um, right, to, um, for for the growth to happen. One of the I things. Mean, I think that, oh, go ahead, Chris. Well, you know, there in, in this world, there's all this talk about, you know, what kind of church do you go to, and is it a this this denomination or that or no denomination or liberal or or whatever uh, conservative, and what does that even mean? Um, and I actually truly believe that when we, when we are in fellowship with people who don't, who see who see eye to eye on the gospel, but don't see eye to eye on other aspects that we benefit 
from explaining ourselves. Um, only if it's, it's only beneficial if it's all the way around, but I think that's a goal. Um, I think that's a far better way to be, to, to both incorporate what is being talked about here with the freedoms and understand why we came to this position, particular place. I think it's only strengthening. Um, it also can keep us humble if we're really willing to say, well, I've always thought of it this way, but th there's a point to that. Um, and I don't know, most of the time, I think we, we just decide we're going to either be quiet or go somewhere else or find people that think like we do. And I think we lose something in that. Yeah. The problem is in practice, it's actually really, really hard unless everyone's taking it seriously, I think. It is, but I think you're right. I, I, I really believe uh, the Bible is to be read together as a community um, because of that very thing. If, if we, and that doesn't mean we depend on the community to tell us what it means, but I, I think it's important that we read it um, as, a, as a community because we, we, we are all touched by the gospel in specific ways, in specific places in our lives, and we've come from specific places, and we, uh, we, we live in specific contexts, and, and and all of the stuff God is doing uh, is done in those places and contexts. And, and, and none of us are alike, exactly. And we can really broaden our view of things and really see sort of the, the, the different facets of God's grace when we start to understand it through other people. And it helps us with those blind spots that Ron was exactly. talking about. Exactly, it helps us to see where we're falling short, where where we you know uh, where, where we uh, where we don't understand some things, or we don't understand them the same way somebody else does, and and it it, it gives us that sense of humility that he mentions here, right? That uh, we we don't have all the answers ourselves. We don't have it all figured out individually, and we can really do a lot and a lot can be done when we in us and in one another when we start to to take the community seriously and the the the, the differences and the diversity uh, that every community has I, I don't even mean you know <laughs> you know this you don't have to look very far to find diversity to find community I mean everybody in this group uh, there, there's a lot of differences here there's a lot of diversity here and and I think because of that, we can really grow and learn in our ability to hear and accept the word planet in us. Um, I, I think there's one more thing there that's yeah. really important. So at our comp my company, where I work called Alas, um, they formulated some principles of one Alas, trying to sort of unify everyone. And one of them I was actually really struck by um, that a company would adopt, and it was assume positive intent yeah and if, if that's integrated um that really makes a difference and and by the way i think generally at northwest that lesson has been learned um but i think that really helps um facilitate people to be able to honestly say what they think and, and the like but it also then because it's facilitating that I think it allows for this kind of diversity of viewpoint that actually helps us. Um, so, you know, when you make one of your incredibly crazy points up there on the on, on Sunday morning, you know, I just, well, that's just Patrick, right? No, no, I don't do that. Um, you can't be dismissive of it either, right? Um, but I, I think oftentimes, you know, when I was growing up, the idea was, well, you had to pay attention and, you know, you had to look up every... Um, scripture that the preacher mentions because, you know, he might be wrong. Well, that's not 
I, I mean, that's fine, but that's not really the attitude here. We're not, the goal is not to be critics of, of, of everyone to, to see if there's any, you know, issue. I, I think that's actually destructive to worship because that's sort of worship as a divisive kind of, kind of thing, looking for ways to criticize. Surely that's contrary to what Paul is even talking about in Corinthians um, when, when he talks about worship. So um, I've never, I never grew up hearing that. What was the point of that? Oh, you got to stick to the truth, Christy. You got to <laughs> always watch. And do what if you disagree? Then you confronted them <laughs> afterwards and you told them how they were wrong and you pointed to the scripture and you, you said that this, that, and the other. Now, I'm not saying that it happened in the church that I grew up in, but it wasn't far off from times when it would happen. Um, and who decided I, if that happened? I remember the sentiment. I, I remember hearing that, you know, said. I don't, I don't know that people were, you know, trying to find fault, but I do, I do recall hearing that sentiment, you know, and it, I think it was also sort of intended to motivate our you own didn't know your body. Study, you you didn't know, know our own yeah. study of the scripture. That's how I heard it. it. It was never to criticize. It was make sure if you're hearing yeah. something, just don't take it hook, line, and sink. sink right, it. So right. make sure you know what they're saying as well, which I think is very important. But I like what we're talking about because it, I think it's in, Rome, um, in Romans where it talks about accept one another, especially if our faith is so weak, what we eat, that we have a respect, a healthy respect. But um, that's one side of it. And then I was also thinking to get to this place of humility and accepting the word, we have to, I believe this, that the Bible has to be the standard. We don't have to all agree on it as we're talking about it, but is it the truth or is it not the truth? Is it the thing that we're looking to to guide us? And then the, the second thing, I was just reading about this today, that we, we, we pray to the Holy Spirit and God to guide us. And, and to keep us open to hearing what the scriptures have to say, or brothers and sisters have to say, however we get the truth. And um, I think our consciences, and this is what Chrissy was just saying, I think our consciences helps us to know what truth is. It's an innate thing, especially according to faith. So, um, yeah. And it keeps us, if that's what's, I think what I'm saying and what Christy was saying, if that's the truth, then we can't be arrogant about it and we can't be dogmatic that I know I'm the truth. It, it keeps you humbly accepting with some kind of confidence, but yet not a, like you're wrong and I'm right. It's It always sends me a way to go study more or pray more or something when uh, there's, there's a friction that's there. I, I one of the, Something that really impacted me several years ago. Um, it was during the George Floyd uh, incident and 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 uh, the fallout from that and the responses to that on kind of all around our, our culture and uh, our society and uh, some positive, some negative. And uh, Greg Watson uh, said, emailed me. He said. Um, I, I want to send you this. I want. I want to know what you think of it. You know, I, how, how do you? You know, he wanted my sort of feedback on it. Which, as I read it, I was like, it's crazy that he's asking me for feedback on this. And I told him basically, I there was nothing I needed to say about this. This was you know, something I could learn from. And it was he was it was a, his view of some of the racial issues in our in our culture and and as they relate to faith and as they relate to the church and, and the larger culture. And, and uh, to hear, you know, to, to hear that, read that from, from him really impacted me a lot. It, it really helped me think through some things that I, I, that I knew I didn't understand fully, but, but that, you know, I, I could see his point of view of this and I could, I could, I, I could hear the, the experience that was behind and the hurt that was behind some of the the, the things he he wrote, and uh, it, it really it, it was amazing. And, it, and it's amazing how and that happens to me over and over again uh, to, to to meet someone with a different perspective from mine. 
um, can be so challenging. And, and sometimes that's uncomfortable. It really is. But if you push through that, it's worth it. Uh, because even if you don't come to all the same conclusions, as we're talking about, you, you're stretched and you're out of your comfort zone and you, you grow a little and God does some things uh, in us. And uh, I, I just think that's really uh, a blessing that I've enjoyed that, that maybe I wouldn't in some other places, uh, wouldn't have the opportunity to enjoy But I, I think as we as we go on in this text, uh, it, it's it's the, the accepting of the word uh, uh, also connects with not really listening. You do what it says. I think one of the things James expects is that as this word is implanted in us, it hasn't really taken root until we're acting on it. Uh, and, and until we're 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 doing the things that it, it says. Um, he has this sort of puzzling <laughs> uh, uh, metaphor of, uh, or simile of someone looking in a mirror and then walking away and forgetting what he looked like. Um, and and, and it's, it's sort of a, a strange little, little metaphor because it's something we don't really consider. Um, whether he meant, you know, uh, there's a, some shades of what he could have meant there, but, um, but but the idea being, I think that you know, if it's not really taking root in us and it's not affecting the things we do, and we're not we're not living it out, because sometimes what the gospel says we need to do um, doesn't come naturally. Uh, you, you, wouldn't you like that? To, you know, you, you you hear the gospel and then just automatically you just do the things that it tells you to do uh you know that'd be that'd be nice with it just to have that 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 ease but that it doesn't come naturally sometimes um, and, and so it takes work it takes effort it takes intention to accept the word planted in us and do it and live it out and you know make the changes and the arrangements in your life and the rearrangements in your life that are required to to do what this says otherwise you forget it, right otherwise it does not really take root yeah chris uh, you asked us early on about what the word was and um i think we said it was the gospel right it's the gospel story seems to be yeah Seems to be from, um, uh, I'm, just, I'm thinking about from uh, verse uh, 18, uh, the, he chose to give us, God chose to give us birth through the word of truth. Uh, uh, yeah, I think so. so. So doing what it says isn't the letters of Paul or the commandments of the Old Testament it's everything wrapped up in the gospel and the sacrifice of Jesus and what that tells us to do in our lives, in my opinion. It's not, making, right. not I'm not saying that those other things aren't important. They're all, they're all in our Bibles. But I think this is referring to incorporating what you've accepted as the gospel message and how that turns it around. So it's not a list. We, we've been I, saying... I do what it says as if it's like a set of instructions. I think it's incorporating it and living it out. Always thinking of what Jesus did for us. That's not a list of instructions. I, I think of Philippians 2, right? Where Paul, Philippians 2, uh, Philippians 3. Well, Philippians 2, Paul talks about Jesus, you know, the, this great hymn of Jesus emptying himself and becoming, you know, it, and putting himself aside and 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 uh, becoming flesh, letting go of equality with God, and, and and or not not reaching for it, not grasping for it, and uh, and and becoming a servant, and and even giving up his life. And then he talks about um, how you should have that mind in yourself, right? Uh, that's that's a response to the gospel. The gospel is. 
uh, you know, this story of Jesus giving himself up. Um, so one of the ways we do what the gospel says is we, we have that same mind in ourselves when we are interacting with other people and we're looking out for their interests and we're giving ourselves up for them and we're showing them the same love that Christ showed us. All of that is what you're talking about, Christy, is, is, as you're talking about, Christy, is, is, is what I think James has in mind here, that this, this gospel is creating something in you. It doesn't just unroll a list and hand it to you. It, it's creating something in you. It's changing the way you live your life. And, and it, it's intending to. And so, but sometimes, again, there's intentionality involved in going out and doing these things, living this way. Uh, reflecting the truth of the gospel in the way you do it. And it's not just about conversion either. Sometimes we, we you know, we see that, you know, uh, you know, do what the word says. And, and we, we assume that means, well, that means I need to repent and I need to confess Jesus and I need to be baptized. And it may mean that, but that's not all James has in mind here, right? That's not all he's talking about. It's not just this moment of conversion. It's all the ways the gospel says, the gospel challenges us and asks us to trust God and humbly accept what he's doing and, and walk by the spirit instead of the flesh and all those things that, that ripple out from the work of the gospel in our lives. All that to say, yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> That makes me think of the scriptures to hear you speak, um, Patrick, that talks about clothing ourselves in Christ. Yeah, isn't that a great yeah, that we clothe ourselves in, Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, that yeah, we clothe no, no, ourselves no, 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 in Christ. And then he talks about the fruit of the spirit, that this fruit of the spirit. That that is it, like Chris you saying, that's not a list. That's that's a being, right? That's a joining ourselves with with Christ and we become this and it doesn't happen overnight and it's a lot of boo-boos made and you know it's uh but it's this attitude of being cold in Christ and striving to be as much as I possibly can which is not an easy thing but it, it's that's the road I'm on the fruit of the spirit like makes you think of stuff just exploding out of the soil right it's just, just, you know, they just, just stuff just popping out of the ground and tomatoes coming up and cucumbers and you know, whatever. And, and, and you're just thinking about, it's thinking about what, what the gospel is doing, what the spirit is doing in your life to, to create and, and to make new things and to create this new life. Uh, that, that's, that's, those agricultural metaphors are there for a reason because it, it's not just, you know, you're checking off rules. It's God's doing something, right? And and we're cooperating with it or we're not. Um, and then putting on Christ, uh, and that, that that comparison, it feels like Paul is, is talking a little more about the effort it takes for us, right? <laughs> to to put off the old self and to put on the new, new thing, to put on this new thing that, that God's doing in us. Uh, if you want to extend the metaphor, it's God that gives you the clothes, right? It's, it's Jesus that gives you the clothes, but, but we got to put them on. So, so I mean, there's there's stuff for us to do, but it, it's all in response or in concert with what God is already doing. Um, and so, yeah, there's just all these pictures that, that Paul, especially Jesus uses too, though, that just talked about all these ways in which we can think of, of, of God doing these things in our lives. And, and we are we need to, uh, verse 25 of, of James uh, 1 here, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they'll be blessed in what they do. Um, I don't know. Do we, do we use a bit of laws giving freedom? Uh, I know when I was a kid, I always thought rules were restrictive, man. And, you know, rules kept you from going where you wanted to go and doing what you wanted to do. Um, Depends which side of the rule you're on. I'm sorry? 
depends which side of the rule you're on. A law that's against a, murder that's gives that's us freedom that's to that's live that's safely, right? I suppose that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. A law, law against companies exploiting their workers gives the workers freedom to be safe and yeah. live their lives. So that's exactly right. Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, the law restricts somebody who wants to kick down your door and come into your house, but it also gives you the freedom to live in your house safely and, and without worrying about that or without fearing that as much. Um, yeah, but I like that phrase about the perfect law that gives freedom. Uh, you look intently into it, but you don't stop with looking intently into it. You then turn it around and you live it out in your life. And, and that perfect law, there's a, a debate about what he means exactly, but it, it, it's, it, it's clearly the gospel. It's clearly, it may mean some other things too, but it's, clearly it's the gospel, it's the good news, it's the love of God in Christ that uh, that gives us freedom from sin and from death and from fear, and uh, uh, so you, you you look intently into it, but then you go and you you do it again. Not just the rules, right? You go and you live by what this 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 gospel says. Which brings us to verse 26 then. Those who consider themselves religious and do not, and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And there's a couple of examples here, sort of positive and negative, right? Uh, on the one hand, you've got the person who considers himself uh, religious is the word. Religiously observant, maybe, is a, a way to put it. Um, it's the person who, he never misses church, right? And he, he never, he knows his Bible, and he knows the, the songs, and he's particip participating, and he's part of things, uh, and he's enthusiastic about it, maybe, um, or she. Um, but then goes out and just spews bile everywhere they go. Right, just just berates people and just beats them down and makes them feel small and mocks and and just just awful kind of, of, of speech that he pictures here. He'll go on in chapter three, of course, and expand that some. But uh, but this 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 person who is so religiously observant and yet won't even try to keep the tight rein on their tongue and on the way they speak. Or maybe it applies to people who make too many comments during Bible class. You know? Maybe, maybe it does. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Surely not. <laughs> um, so, so you know, so you, and James uses a, a tough word there. He says their religion is they deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Uh, worship is actually a, a, a synonym or a, a close synonym for for religion here I mean, in, in, that, in that verse. The word there can mean, again, it has to do with the things you do in, when, you're, when you're trying to be religious, those, those things that you do. Um, it's, it's worthless because it's not, it's not allowing that word to grow and to develop and to change. That, he's not saying this person is doomed to destruction or anything like that, but he is saying, that the, the, the religion that they are enacting in their lives um, isn't real because it's not changing the way they live. Now, none of us are perfect, right? And James will go on in chapter three to say, nobody can feign the time. Uh, it's tough. So he's not talking here about you're perfect, you're perfect, you're perfect, you're always getting it straight. You're always... He's talking about people who aren't even attempting to keep a tight rein on their tongue. That's one example. That's sort of the negative one. The positive one is the other way, right? Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Um, so what does, he, what does he mean? I mean, he means those things, obviously. 
Uh, is that all he means? Is that the only way you know if religion is is worth is worthless or acceptable? If you're looking out for widows and orphans and watching your tongue and not being polluted by the world, is that the only way you know? What is he getting at here? What's he saying? What is acceptable worship based on what James says? Well, let's start with the... Well, James, this is the beginning of James probably start announcing and following sort of Greek culture, words versus deeds. And, yeah. and he sort of alluded already to a lot of words, um, and that's not the way to go. Deeds are what he's looking for. And I mean, it's an interesting passage, um, but I think we, we buy that. I mean, the world views Mother Teresa as holy because she spent her life looking yeah. after... I'm, because it is so selfless. Um, and even if you're looking after yourself, if you're recognizing the needs of others, um, and I, I think it's sort of interesting, you were talking about um, Hendiades, um, two things joined together that really are the same thing. I, I think there might actually be a connection here that if you're really focused on looking after or orphans and widows in their distress, I suspect you're probably also going to be keeping yourself from being polluted by the world. I, I mean, because your focus has shifted um, there. Um, so, you know, we're not saved by deeds, but surely there need to be deeds as a result of being saved um, too, yeah. which is, I think, what James is going to be elaborating on, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's a good way to say it. We're, we're not saved by the things we do, but surely... As you said, surely if the gospel is having its way in us, um, it's going to provoke uh, certain needs in, the, in, in, in us and, cho and choices that we make and priorities that we set. Those who are, James is very concerned with those who are on the margins, those who are out of the, the mainstream, don't have the privileges that a lot of people enjoy in society. And He's isn't what that what love is all about in just a different yeah. term to it is absolutely to recognize yeah. somebody else's needs as taking precedence over yours, to be yeah. always looking out for other people and and making that leap. Yeah. Um so it, it all ties together. It's just different wording or different approaches. Which are helpful because they see it, allow us to see it from different angles. But it's worship. I and mean, we've talked about that before, right? Alan and, and other people have brought out that that's what true worship is, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, this, this that's how that's how you know that the things you do are acceptable. They they issue out into it doesn't mean you never come together to worship. If you're coming together to worship and you're not caring much for folks who are in need, something's something's wrong, right? There's there's a there's a disconnect somewhere. Uh, that's not the kind of worship God's looking for. Uh, the, the the next chapter begins with this kind of maybe if you know James at least kind of well known um, uh, example of. Uh, Favoritism, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting, comes to church, right? Comes to, to, comes to this time when we're, we're together and we're encouraging each other and we're worshiping and we're singing hymns and we're joining in communion and we're reading scripture. Uh, all these things that are so important in our lives, right? He comes into this meeting and he's wearing gold, a gold ring and fine clothes and then there's also a poor man in filthy old clothes who's there. And you give special attention, he says, to the man wearing fine clothes. Here's a good seat for you over here. You know, make sure you, you take this nice seat. You know, 
making people get up and making people sit on the floor and so that this man can have his seat. Uh, you sit the poor man on the floor or you know, stand back there, or sit on the floor by my feet. And he says, you've discriminated among yourselves and you've become judges with evil thoughts. And then here's the gospel. Uh, Christy, you talked about, you know, the, the way the gospel sort of impacts us and impacts our whole lives and the way we see things, the way we value things. Here's the gospel in James 2, 5. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? Yeah, the way the, the, the effect the gospel has on us ought to change the way we see the people around us. It ought to give great value to people who maybe lack it in the eyes of the world. And maybe <laughs> it, it affects how much value we place on the people who are highly valued by the world. Um, and and it, it affects how we then treat them. Verse 8, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture... Love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing right. But if you sin and show, if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Royal law. Perfect law gives freedom. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and again. Well, he's going to push this to... even more in just, just a few verses, right? It's not just the poor man. You shouldn't make him unequal. unequal to the rich man, he's going to actually now go on to say, and by the way, you should do something about those dirty clothes. Absolutely, but, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so it's not just, it, so the poor the, the poor person actually needs more attention from you as a response of your faith than, than the rich person who comes in um, and the like, so. Yeah, this poor person who comes in, comes to you, you know, asking for, some help, and you say, "Go be warmed and fed." Well, what's that? You know, what what's really changed? What's really transformed? Sort of an early example of equality um, across meaning. Actually, for some, you have to do more than others. It's not just a, an even fence across that. Uh, you know, if somebody can't see, you may have to give them a stool, uh, yeah. right? A, a boost. Give them a boost. Take is, the, <laughs> is the is the is the dis discrepancy between the rich and poor in the assembly an example being given of favoritism? Do we think? Don't use favoritism, for example don't benefit those who are rich because that's not how God sees it? Or is that the point? Is it just about how you treat the rich and the poor in your assembly? Well, I, I think it begins sort of with this picture of, of rich and poor in the assembly, but I think it goes far beyond just, just what happens in worship, you know, and, and how we treat people in worship. Um, goes beyond, because again, it's it's the, the impact of the gospel on your priorities, your value system, uh, what's important, what's not, what's valuable, what's not. Um, and, and all of that is transformed by what God is doing in us through Jesus. And, and uh, so, I mean, I think it carries over to the rest of life as well, as worship should, right? If you're I, together, I actually... Go ahead. I'm sorry, I actually meant, do we, are we being warned to be careful about other means of favoritism when we decide who sits where and who does? So I don't think, I cannot imagine someone coming to our church and being thought of more highly because they had a fancy suit on or um, dirty clothes. I just don't. There may be other insidious ways we might accidentally do that, but I just don't think that's in our way of doing things. I think it, it can at some places, but um, but are we are there other ways? Are we um, 
giving, pri do we give prior, I'm not saying we do, I'm just putting it out there, like people who can quote you more scripture or people who've, you know, been all their lives in a church of Christ or, you know, are, are there other ways we can discriminate based uh, without intending to that, or does this not apply to that? Is this simply like who you are in society versus, you know, someone who's more well-spoken or someone who's been successful in their line of work? Are, th are there ways that we need to be aware of? Um, and I don't, I don't know. I don't know if this is an example or. I guess I would say, you know, anything that makes us value somebody over somebody else, there's the at least potential there, right, for favoritism. Um, there's, the, there's the potential there that we might treat someone as better than someone else. I mean, Whether we would say that or not, articulate that or not, um, there are certainly ways that we would do that. I, I can tell you, uh, I, I mean, Personally, it, I'm talking to someone who sounds kind of educated and versus someone who doesn't. I, my tendency is to overvalue the person who sounds educated and undervalue the person who does not. And that's wrong. And, and just down, out loud, that's wrong. That's, that's wrong of me um, to, to do so. Um, I think I think all of us have had the experience of seeing someone in shabby clothes somewhere, whether it's at church or somewhere else, and wanting to, you know, or at least the impulse that we sometimes have of, I don't know that I want to get involved there. You <laughs> know, just there's there's I think we have these these tendencies absolutely to value some over others, and I think James wants us to. Put a stop to that. This seems to be, this seems to be specifically about when you come together to assemble. Like this seems very not just how you live your life. This seems very specific about. Well, I can certainly say I've been in the Church of Christ forty years, almost fifty. Oh, I just aged myself. Well, anyway, um, I so you were real little when you started. <laughs> I certainly have felt a difference, and. And being a woman, speaking up when I shouldn't because I'm not a male, being African American, being single, and I've been absolutely like, oh, you, you can't go here or do this. You should have your spouse do whatever. So I think it is when we come together that that oh, and let's I didn't talk about wealth or money, but same thing there. But um. Yeah, I think I think it's real in the church. I certainly have experienced it in the church um, on multiple levels, many many times, and yeah, <laughs> and, and and I think maybe James uses that illustration uh, in part to to draw up the distinction between the person who comes, you know, all ready to worship and all, you know, and and yet right there in the middle of that time when you're worshiping and should be letting the gospel transform the way we see other people, you're just falling right back into the same old patterns and the same old fleshly impulses uh, there in the middle of that, that time of worship. Uh, well, and, and I would explain it personally. Someone said this to me. It's if you're the other, <laughs> that favoritism is not shown towards you, it's, it's like a low brain migraine headache. Yeah. It's a humming that you're always experiencing. And you learn to live with it because, you know, it's just the way life is. And I think in the church, sometimes we can have that. Um, yeah, I, I think, and we can, I think Ron talked about, you know, if you go over your head, you just kind of, you don't pay attention to it after, after a while until something bigger happens or someone says something you go oh yeah there we go again but it's 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 with you if you're the other less faithful one of the one of the things greg said in the document that i i read it really struck me he talked about how black men and women hear questions like what do you do 
where do you live? I often hear those as, are you one of us? And that, that migraine, right? That buzzing that's always there in your, in your head. Um, yeah. I, I thought that was really, really. Yeah, it's real. A quick, a quick story. I was teaching over there at Nepal. And one of my students, for whatever reason, I was sitting out giving her direction. She touched my thigh, well, you know, my hand and thigh. She says, where did you get your degree? And I went, no, you didn't. Just say that to me. But I I'm sorry, say, she said what? Where did I get my degree? Oh, oh. Where am I from? You know, what makes me qualified to teach at Nepal? That's what I heard. How dare you tell me I have to go get my disability form? Because that's what I was telling her. I go, well, we won't talk about that right now. Let's talk about what you need. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Redirect. It's always, yeah, it's, it's, uh. and, and I think the earlier scripture about being slow, quick to listen and slow to talk is when we're not the person that's been, uh, it's like what you said with listening when Greg asked you your opinion. It, it That's, when we're slow to talk and quick to listen is if we're not in that person's shoes and don't give the, them a lecture about how it shouldn't bother somebody. Yeah. Yeah. I think the issue with single people in the church is probably one of the under looked at, um, at issues. Do you, you know, cause it, you, you've got this model or whatever, that's like probably never really was true because in the old days, people lost their spouses way more than now and stuff, but it's it's not something we look at, but we need to be listening for that and thinking about it and um, not quoting the Bible back to somebody who's got a different experience from us, in my opinion. I know when I first started coming to Northland, I don't know if you remember this, Patrick, um, that's when I was teaching one of the Sunday school classes and we would have really good conversations in there about a lot of things. And I asked you, I said, well, what if someone gay walked into our church? What would be your response? How would, how would you as the minister, or you, I don't know if you remember me asking you that, but um, we talked about it a lot in Sunday school about others being singled and coming in. And your response was spot on in that we'd love them like we love everybody else. We'd welcome them. We'd greet them. And you don't know that was like, phew, because <laughs> I've been in churches <laughs> where the response would have been something totally different. So I was really happy at the beginning to hear that because I just started coming to Northwest that we would yeah. love them. And that seems yeah, like care for them. That seems like about the least I could have said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. But, yeah. Um, that's right. Um, all right, we, we need to wind up for tonight. Thank you so much for your 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 comments, your thoughts. Really appreciate the things you you have to say every week, and and uh, I think some really important stuff. Maybe next week, if we want to continue um, in this vein, we certainly can, and uh, and then pick up on some other things that uh, uh, that we will be talking about. But thank you so much for your uh, all your your great comments and your thoughts. Really appreciate all of you. Good to see you all. Hope you have a wonderful week. And see you Sunday.